Martin Luther dearly loved Paul's letter to the Romans. In Luther's preface to each of the books of the New Testament, he had this to say about Romans. This letter is truly the most important piece in the New Testament. It is purest gospel. It is well worth a Christian's while, not only to memorize it word for word, but also to occupy themselves with it daily, as though it were the daily bread of the soul. It is impossible to read or to meditate on this letter too much or too well. The more one deals with it, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. Very high praise there. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying here in a Lutheran church that Luther was wrong, uh, but I should offer my own pastoral encouragement that there is much more to the scripture than just Romans. And while it is wonderful, please spend time there. I do encourage you to meditate upon all of the other books of the Bible. But Romans is well worth our time, particularly as Lutherans, as this passage that we enter into today shines a light on the very core of our Lutheran theology, perhaps why it meant so much to Brother Martin. Last week, we heard Paul's greeting in Romans 1, setting the tone for this letter as one of mutual encouragement between himself and the church in Rome. Since then, we missed a a wonderful conversation over the first four chapters around sin and human nature and our need for God's love that sets up the context of this important opening statement in chapter 5. Because Paul really doesn't let any of us off the hook for how much we, as a result of sin, don't deserve the love of God. Before saying, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Hearing these words from Paul, I was drawn back to a moment in my senior year of high school. In the fall of 2008, the homecoming dance was upon us, and I had picked out a nice suit, I'd retrieved flowers for my date, and I was nervously spending the morning of the dance getting ready. And I had one last task. I was to take my old 1995 Jeep Grand Cherokee to the car wash so that my car would be nice and clean for our night out. But it was then that my dad called out for me to stop as I was walking across the driveway. And as I turned around, he tossed me the keys to his brand new red 2008 Mustang. (laughs) I could not really process what was happening in that moment or or what these keys in my hand meant. My dad, I, I knew he had dreamed since he was a kid of owning a Mustang. And after working really hard, when he found a good deal, he finally decided to splurge in the fall of 2008 and buy the car he always wanted. It was his baby. I'm not going to question whether more than me at that point, but it was, and he had just tossed me the keys. It was dumbstruck. I was standing there, my jaw hanging open, saying, Are you sure? Are you sure you want me to drive your Mustang? Are you letting me drive the Mustang? I kept thanking him, but I I just couldn't believe that he was allowing this. Me? I I was... I was a good driver, but I only had my license for about a year at that point. I worked, I worked hard to follow all the laws, but I, I knew I wasn't perfect. Probably rolled through a stop sign or two. Maybe sped a little bit. Definitely had a tendency to drive too fast in the rain. Failed to signal every now and then. Probably lost my cool with another driver on the road. So, so surely he couldn't really be letting me drive the Mustang. My doubt, my second guessing, my excited questions, they kept pouring out until it was time to go. And as I backed out of the driveway and hit the road, I still couldn't believe that it was happening. That this scene 
is what I imagine as Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 5. In a much grander way even, they have just been handed the keys to a brand new Mustang. And like me, I don't think they could believe it. Paul has just spent the last four chapters extensively outlining the ways of sin through which we don't deserve to drive the Mustang. Sure, they have tried their best to follow the law, but they've broken it many times as well. And yet, they've just been handed the keys. This Pauline parable this is to say the kingdom of God is like your father's brand new Mustang, entrusted to you when you don't deserve it, loaned to you with a generous and loving heart. Now, I know I'm probably going to catch a little bit of grief for telling a story about something nice that my dad did while sharing Mother's Day lunch with my family today, but that's my burden to bear and not yours, so you don't need to worry about that. But that this, this is God's love for us, that while we were still sinners, we were handed the keys to the kingdom through God's grace. We know We don't deserve it. We've done nothing on our own to merit this gift, but it is our holy parents' good pleasure to hand us the keys. And as we contemplate this amazing gift of grace, as we'll do often through Paul's letter to Rome, we can find ourselves maybe like a young me, standing slack-jawed in the driveway, wondering if this can really be true. God, are you sure? The kingdom is mine? Do you know me? Do you, do you know the mistakes that I've made through my life? Because I don't deserve your kingdom. Are you sure grace is mine? You're handing me the keys. And God's answer to us again and again is a resounding yes. God gives us God's yes through Christ Jesus. It's this message of love and reconciliation and restoration of relationships that we are called to share precisely because we are so worthy, because we haven't done anything to deserve this for ourselves. But God proves his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's okay to have this sense of wonder and awe when it comes to understanding grace. We can stand dumbstruck in the driveway, wondering if God's promises are true. That's when we come back to this assembly and seek to gain our composure and our certainty with one another. When we gather in love and fellowship, we remember that we are one in Christ through the waters of baptism. We gather at this table and renew ourselves in tasting this salvation that is so unbelievable. Because it's precisely in these waters and at this table that we're reminded again and again of how God's grace works. God acts. And we live in faithful response. I know it's it's a bit nerdy to dive into the linguistic details of the Greek in this passage, but there's some ambiguity in translation that actually opens this text up in a beautiful way. We heard in the NRSV today, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But the Common English Bible, another translation that I appreciate quite a lot, says, Since we have been made righteous through his faithfulness, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified by faith or made righteous through his faithfulness. Whose faith is it? The pretty critical question of theology. Are we justified through our faith in God or are we justified through God's faithfulness to us? The answer is unclear in Greek, and perhaps that means the answer is yes. We are called to have faith, and yet faith is a gift, something outside of ourselves that we receive when we don't even deserve it or earn it. Through this gift of faith that we receive, we come to know grace, hope, and peace, and yet time and time again throughout Scripture, When it comes to God's people being called to walk in faith, it only ever happens after God has first had faith in them. God is faithful to Abraham first, and then the covenant is made. God is constantly faithful to Israel before delivering them from Egypt and before they renew their covenant. God has faith in Mary before she consents to carry Christ. Christ is faithful to Paul before he ceases persecuting Christ's followers and joins the Spirit in the work of building the church. 
And so it is with the sacraments of the church. God is faithful to us first through the waters, making us one with Christ and one with all God's people before we understand what it means to live out our faith. God feeds us with abundant life and forgives us through the meal of salvation before we are sent, renewed to share this faithfulness with all the world. As we walk in newness of life, we are only ever able to do this, to find justification through the gift of faith because God's love has come first and invited us along the way. We as Christians are called to live in joyful response to all that God has done because all good gifts come from God first. Even in the midst of suffering, we're told in Romans, that God is faithful to us sowing hope and giving us endurance that we need to rise again and share life. That is why in this season of new life, we are talking as a community about our stewardship and how we live generously as God's people. God has been generous to us, handing us the keys to a way of life that the crueler structures of our world say we don't deserve. But God has called us worthy. God proclaims that we are enough. And then in our own sense of sufficiency, we are called to live abundantly. As God has been generous, so too are we called to be generous. We give freely knowing that all we have has been given freely. Our love, our hope, our time, our gifts, our finances, all things are a gift that we are meant to share freely in the trust that God has already provided first. The faith expressed here in Romans 5 is God's and it is ours. Our life together of mutual encouragement is one of sharing this gift of love. We can do so with wonder, joy, and awe, the likes of which a 17-year-old has as they're handed the keys of a beautiful red Mustang. We can even do so with the persistent question, are you sure? Nagging at our conscience. And all the while, we'll trust that we'll have God in this community to remind us that indeed, we are each enough. We are each beloved. We are each redeemed that we may live generously into this new life we've been given. As we serve, as we strive for justice, equality, hope, generosity, and reconciliation throughout our broken world, we do so boasting only in the love of God and not our own human power. On that fateful homecoming night, I don't remember exactly what I said to my friends as I pulled up to our group pictures with my date driving that red Mustang. I'd like to think that I wasn't boasting solely in the fact that I was driving a Mustang. Rather, I hope that I was sharing with joy how good and gracious it was that my father had given me the Mustang to drive. It wasn't my car, but its use was a gift of generous love. Grace isn't something of our own making. It is God's gift of generous love. And so as we go about this work of the kingdom, we are called not to boast in our own gifts, but in God's love. We boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. As we serve and love our community, as Lutherans, we know that we do God's work with our hands. It's God's love being revealed, not just the best of ourselves. We give glory to God for the work at hand. And when we humbly turn back again, wondering if it's real that we've been given this gift of grace, that's okay. God is here in water and meal to offer us the first word of encouragement and sufficiency. I hope that through your continued generosity and through God's eternal generosity, we can do that work of doubting and questioning and growing and sending here in this place at Muhlenberg. Because as we wrap our hearts and minds around this profound gift of grace, we don't just stand here in the driveway talking about it. Rather, we know it is time to drive. Amen.